Part 1. The First Stage of Rapture The parasite hates three things, free markets, free will, and free men. Andrew Ryan Chapter 1. Park Avenue, New York City, 1946 Almost a year later, Bill McDonough is riding an elevator up to the top floor of Andrew Ryan Arms. But he felt like he was sinking under the sea. He was tooting a box of pipe fittings in one hand, a toolkit in the other. He had been sent so hastily by the maintenance manager, he didn't even have the bloody name of the customer. But his mind was on earlier doings in another building, a small office building in Lower Manhattan. He had taken the morning off from his plumbing business to interview for an assistant engineer job. The pay would start low, but the job would take him in a more ambitious direction. They looked at him with only the faintest interest when he had walked into the Feban, Lieber and Quiff engineering firm. The two interviewers were a couple of snotty bankers. One of them was Feban Jr. They seemed bored by the time they called him in, and the faint flicker of interest evaporated completely when he started talking about his background. He had done his best to speak in American phraseology to suppress his accent, but he knew it slipped out. They were looking for some snappy young chap out of New York University, not a cocky cockney writer, not a cockney writer, who'd worked his way for the East London School of Engineering and Mechanical Vocation. Bill heard them say it through the door after they dismissed him. Another limey grease monkey. All right then. So he was a grease monkey, just a mechanic, and lately a freelance plumbing contractor, a dirty little job screwing pipes for the knobs. Heading up some rich bloke's penthouse, there was no shame in it, but there wasn't much money in it either. Working on assignment for Chinowski's maintenance, it would be a long time before he could save up enough to start a big contracting outfit of his own. He had a couple of lads hired on from time to time, but not the big contracting and engineering company he had always envisioned. Mary Louise had made it clear as polished glass she was not really interested in marrying a glorified plumber. I had enough of fellas that think they're the cat's meow because they can fix the toilet, she said, a pretty girl from the Bronx with his Mary, Lee's, Mary Louise Fenson, a maroon to go, but not terribly bright, after all, probably driving barnum, barmy anyway. The moment he got home, the phone rang, Bud Chinowski, barking about getting his ass to an address in Manhattan on Park Avenue. Their building maintenance was AWOL, probably drunk somewhere and a big shot at the penthouse needed plumbers. Plus, he can drag your lazy ass over there. We've got three bathrooms to finish installing. Get this whip, this wrench jockeys of yours over there too. He called, uh, he called Roy Finn and Pablo Narvo to go on ahead of him, and then changed out of the ill-fitting suit into the grey grease stained oak coveralls. Lamby grease monkey, he murmured, buttoning up. And here he was, wishing he had taken time for a cigarette before coming. He couldn't smoke in a posh flat like this without permission. He stepped glumly out of the elevator into an antechamber to the penthouse, his doorbox clanking at his side. The little wood panelled room was scarcely bigger than the elevator. An artfully panelled mahogany door with a brush knob embossed with an eagle was its only feature. Besides a small metal grid next to the door, he tried the knob, locked. He shrugged and knocked on the door. Waiting, he started to feel a little claustrophobic. Hello? he called. Plumbing contra contractor from Chinowski's. Hello? D don't drop your H's, you bastard, he told himself. He Hello? A crackling sound, and a low, forceful voice emanated from the grid. That the other plumber, is it? Ah, uh, he, he bent and broke and spoke briskly into the grid. It is, sir. No need to shout into the intercom. The door clicked with it within itself, and to Bill's amazement, it didn't swing inward but slid into the wall up to the knob. He saw there was a metal runner in the floor at the edge of the door, a band of steel. It was wood on the outside, steel inside. I bet this man was worried someone might try to fire a bullet for it. No one was visible on the other side of the open doorway. He saw another hallway carpeted with some rather fine old paintings one of which might be by a Dutch master who remembered anything from his trips to the British Museum. A Tiffany lamp stood on the inlaid table, glowing like a gem. 
This tough has got plenty of the ready, Bill thought. He walked down the hall into a large plush sitting room. Luxurious sofas, a big unlit fireplace, more choice paintings and fine lamps. A grand piano, its wood polished almost mirror-like, stood in the corner. On, the, on an intricately carved table was an enormous display of fresh flowers in an antique Chinese jade vase. He'd never seen flowers like them before, and the decorations on the tables. He was staring at a lamp that appeared to be a gold sculpture of a satyr chasing an undressed young woman when a voice spoke harsh, sharply into the light. The other two were already at work in the back. The main bathroom was through here. Bill turned and saw a gent in the archway to the next room already turning away from him. The man wore a grey suit, his, hair, <coughs> his dark hair rolled back. Must be the butler. Bill could hear the other two lads faintly in the back of the place arguing about the fittings. Bill went through the archway as the man in the suit answered a charming gold and ivory telephone on the table in front of a big window displaying the heroic spires of Manhattan. Opposite the window was a mural, done in the sweeping modern industrial style, of burly men building a tower that rose up out of the sea. Overseeing the workers in the mural was a slim dark haired man with blueprints in his hand. Bill looked for the WC, saw a whole wave of gleaming steel and white towel far from its end. That's my destination, Bill thought bitterly. The crapper. A fine crapper it might be, on the free. My destiny is to keep the WCs in working order. But he called himself. No self pity, now, Bill Madonna. Pay the cards you dealt, the way you die, taught you. Bill started towards the door to the bathroom hall. But his attention was caught by the half whispered urgency of the man's voice as he growled at the telephone. Isley, you will not make excuses. If you cannot deal with these people, I will find someone who has the courage. I will find someone brave enough to scare away this pack of hungry dogs. They will not find my campfire undefended. The voice's stridency caught Bill's attention, but something else about it stirred him too. He had heard that distinctive voice before, maybe in a newsreel. Bill paused at the door to the hall and had a quick look at the man pressing the phone to his ear. It was a man in the mural, the one holding the blueprint, a straight-backed man, maybe early forties, medium height, two thin, crisply straight strokes of moustache matched by the dark strokes of his eyebrows, a prominent cleft chin. He even wore a suit nearly identical to the one in the painting, and like a strong, intense face, it was a face Bill knew from the newspapers. He had seen his name over the front door of every of this very edifice. It never occurred to him that Andrew Ryan might actually live here. The tycoon and a significant chunk of America's coal, its second biggest railroad, and Ryan Oil. He always pictured a man like that whiling the day away playing golf on a country estate. Taxes of theft, Isley. What? No need. I fired her. I've got a new secretary starting today. I'm elevating someone in reception. Elaine something. No, I don't want anyone from counting. That's the whole problem. People like that are too interested in my money. They have no discretion. Sometimes I wonder if there's anyone I can trust. Well, they'll not get a penny out of me more than absolutely necessary. And if you can't see to it, I'll find a lawyer who can. Ryan slammed down the phone and Bill hurried on to the bathroom. Bill found the toilet in place, but not quite hooked up. An ordinary standard toilet, no gold seat on it. Looked like it needed proper pipe fittings, mostly. It seemed a waste of time to send three men out for this, but these posh types liked everything done yesterday. He was aware as he worked that Ryan was pacing back and forth in the room outside the hall to the bathroom, occasionally muttering to himself. Bill was kneeling to one side of the toilet, using a spanner to tighten the pipe joint. When he became aware of a looming presence, he looked up to see Andrew Ryan standing near him. Didn't intend to start for you. Ryan flashed his teeth in the bearer's smile and went on. Just curious of how you're getting along. Bill was surprised at this familiarity from a man so above him, and by the change in tone. Ryan had been blaring angrily into the phone, but minutes before. Now he seemed calm, his eyes glittering with curiosity. Getting on with it, sir. Soon have it done. Is that a brass fitting you're putting in there? I think the other two are using tin. Well, I'll be sure they didn't, sir, said Bill, beginning 
not to care what impression you've made. You don't want to be bailing out your loo once a fortnight. Tin's not reliable, like. If it's the price you're worried about, I'll pick up the cost of the brass, so not to worry, Squire. And why would you do that? Well, Mr. Ryan, no man bears water out of privies built by Bill Madonna. Ryan looked at him with narrowed eyes, rubbing his chin. Bill shrugged and focused on the pipes, feeling strangely disconcerted. He could almost feel the heat from the intensity of Ryan's personality. He could smell his cologne, pricey and subtle. There you are, Bill said, tightening the wrench one last time for good luck. Right as a mail. These pipes, anyhow. Do you mean the job's done? I see how the lights are getting on, but I guess it's very nearly done, sir. He expected Ryan to wander back to his own work, but the tycoon remained, watching, as Bill started the water flow, checked for integrity, and cleaned up his tools and leftover materials. He took the receipt book from his pocket, scribbled out the cost, as if there would be no time for an estimate, so, he'd, so he had a free hand. He wished there were the sort to pad the bill, since he gave a percentage to Chinarski and Ryan was rich, but he wasn't made that way. Really? Ryan said, looking at the bill, eyebrows were raised. Bill just waited. Stranger Andrew Ryan, one of the richest, most powerful men in America, was personally involved in dealing with a plumber, scrutinising a minor bill. But Ryan stood there, looking at the bill, then at him. This is quite reasonable, Ryan said. You might have stretched your time in favour of the bill. People assume they can take advantage of wealthy men. Bill was mildly insulted. I believe in getting paid, sir even being paid well, but only for the work I do. Again, that flicker of a smile, there and gone, the keen, searching gaze. I can see I struck a nerve, Ryan said, because you're a man like me, a man of pride and capability, he, who knows who he is. A long, appraising look. Then Ryan turned on his heel and strode out. Bill shrugged, gathered up the rest of his fingers and returned to the mural room, expecting to see some Ryan underlying expecting to see some Ryan underling waiting with, with, awaiting him with a cheque, but it was Ryan holding the cheque out to him. Thank you, sir. Bill took it and tucked it into a pocket, nodded to the man. Was he mad, stirring him like that? And started hastily for the door. He had just gotten to the sitting room, Ryan called to him from the archway. Mind if I ask you a question? Bill paused, hoping it didn't turn out that Andrew Ryan was the proof he had enough of the off glass piece trying to pick him up. Where do you think a man's right should end? Ryan asked. Is right, sir? A philosophical question asked of a plumbing contractor. The old toff really was mad. Madonna humoured him. Right, sir, right. That's like asking which fingers a man should do without. And you'd attend me. I like that. Now, just suppose you lose one or two fingers. What would you do? You'd think yourself unable to work? You'd have a right to a handout, as it were, eh? Bill hefted the toolbox as he considered. No, I find something to do with eight fingers, or four, make my own way. I like to be able to use my talents more. That's right enough, but I don't take handouts. And what talents are those? Not that I discount a gift for plumbing, but is that what you mean? No, sir, not as much. I'm by way of being an engineer. In a simple way, mind. Good at could be I start my own, my own building operation. Not so young anymore, but still, I see things in my mind. I'd like to build. He broke off, embarrassed at being still personal with this man. But there was something about the rhyme that made you want to open up and talk. You're British. N not one of the gentry types, certainly. Right as rain, sir. Bill wondered if he'd get the brush off now. There was a touch of defensiveness when he added, Grew up round cheap, sir, I'd like. Ryan chuckled dryly. You touch you about your origins. I know the feeling. I too am an, an, I too am an in, immigrant. I was very young when I came here from Russia. I have learned to control my speech, reinvented myself. A man must take of his life a ladder that he never ceases to climb. If you're not rising, you are slipping down the rungs, my friend. But by ascending, Ryan went on, shoving his hands in his jacket pockets and taking a pensive turn about the room, one makes his own class, do you see? Eh? One class is oneself. Bill had been about to make his excuses and walk out, but that stopped him. 
Ryan had articulated something that he freely believed. Couldn't agree more, sir. Bill blurted, that's why I've come to the USA. Anyone can rise up here, right to the top. Ryan grunted sceptically. Yes and no. There are, there are some who don't have the stuff, but it's not the class or race or creed that they were born into that decides it. There's something inside a man, and that's something you have. You're a true mugrump, a real individual. We'll talk again, you and I. Bill nodded goodbye, not believing for a second that they'd speak again. He figured a rich bloke took it into his mind to have a natter with the little people, patronising a chap to prove themselves how fairly and kindly they could be. He headed to check on Pablo and Roy before he made his way to the lobby and went out and about his business. This had been an interesting encounter. It would be a story to tell in the pub, for no one would likely believe him. Andrew Ryan? Who else did you hobnob with? Howard Hughes? Your old pal William Randolph? Asked. Bill Madonna's head was only moderately sore the next morning, and he'd answered his fat, clangorous telephone worthy enough, hoping for work. A good sweat always cleared his head. This Bill Madonna, said a gruff, unfamiliar voice, right enough. My name's Sullivan, head of security for Andrew Ryan. Security? What's he said I've done, Ben? Look here, mate, I'm no crook. No, no, it's something like that. He just sent me to find you. Chinowski didn't want me to give up the number, claimed he'd lost it, trying to get, tried taking the job himself. I had to get it from our friends at the phone company. What job? Why, if you want it, Andrew Ryan's offering you the job as his new building engineer, starting immediately. End of chapter one.